fate of individuals, of nations, of the world, has often hung upon accident, upon decisions that made the other way would have altered the course of human events. Suppose fate had decided that one of the four bullets which pierced George Washington's clothes on July 9th, 1755, during Braddock's defeat, had struck and killed him. Would we have won our independence from England? Or what would have happened if, by a stroke of fate, Hitler had decided not to turn east against Russia before attacking the West? Would we have won World War II? Yes, much depends upon a stroke of fate. And tonight we rewrite history as we present our conception of what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, Robert E. Lee had accepted Lincoln's offer to command the Union Army. And now may I present our narrator for this evening, the noted newspaper columnist, Mr. Walter Kiernan. History tells us that on April 18, 1861, following the surrender of Fort Sumter, the command of the Union forces in the field was offered to Colonel in the United States Army, Robert E. Lee. Several months before, in January 1861, Lee had written, I can anticipate no greater calamity for the country than a dissolution of the Union. It would be an accumulation of the evils we complain of, and I am willing to sacrifice everything but honor for its preservation. Lee, as we know refused the command of the federal forces in the field. But what if fate had willed that one of the noblest, most talented military leaders in our history, Robert E. Lee, had remained with the Union instead of going with his native state of Virginia? April 18, 1861, at the home of Colonel Robert E. Lee, Arlington Heights, Virginia, near Washington, Lee is discussing his vital decision with his wife, Mary Custis. And then my dear Mr. Blair asked me if I would assume the field command of the entire army. He gave me to understand that President Lincoln wanted to know if I would accept that position. Uh, Mr. Blair, Robert? Mr. Francis Blair, Sr. He asked me to come to Washington this morning. You know, his son Montgomery has just been made postmaster general. Both of them have great influence with Mr. Lincoln. Yes, of course. He said that General Scott would remain as commander-in-chief. What was your answer? I told him I wanted a day or two more to think about it. For months, since the other states seceded, I've thought about what I'd do if Virginia left the Union. Now that it has... Robert, if you accept this command, you'll have to invade Virginia, won't you? Yes, Mary, I'm afraid I'd have to, to protect the capital. But how could you raise your hand against your home, your relatives, perhaps your children? I know. But, Mary... How can I desert the flag under which I've spent my entire life, the the flag I've fought for? I've been educated by this country, trained by it as a soldier. How can I desert it? Your father said that Virginia was his country. I'm not light horse Harry Lee. I must make my own decision. Robert, your people are here. There have been Lees in Virginia since 1630, long before there was a United States of America. Yes, but Mary, this is rebellion. George Washington, whom you admire so much, fought in a rebellion against the mother country. But once there was a United States of America. Wasn't Washington an American first and then a Virginia? But, Robert, you... Mary, everything you've said I've thought about, every instinct I have tells me to go with Virginia. This is my home, my people, but even if the South wins this conflict, Virginia will not be safe. What do you mean? If the South can secede and form a confederacy, what is to prevent some of the states within that confederacy from seceding and forming a still smaller one, and so on, until eventually, instead of one strong nation, there's nothing left but weak individual states, the prey of the first powerful country that wants to pounce on them one by one. Oh, if there'd only been more patience on both sides, north and south, this need never have happened. Yes, Mary, for months. I've hoped and prayed that Virginia wouldn't go with the Confederacy. I've hoped and prayed that I wouldn't be faced with this awful decision. (laughs) 
After more soul-searching, Lee finally accepts the Union command. 75,000 volunteers have been called for by the president, and Lee asks for time to train them. But before he is ready, Lee is forced to fight at Bull Run, not far from Washington, where the untrained troops of the Army of the Potomac are defeated by the Confederates under Generals Beauregard and Johnston. And in President Lincoln's office in the White House... Mr. Lincoln, I'm here to offer my resignation as field commander. I'll be very happy to serve in any other capacity you wish. But General Lee, I haven't asked for your resignation. Mr. Lincoln, there have been demands in Congress that I be replaced. They're looking for a scapegoat for Bull Run. But I believe the people have lost confidence in me, Mr. Lincoln. Most of the newspapers have demanded I resign. Mr. Greeley is... Said... General, Mr. Greeley isn't head of this government, and he's not the neck of the government either, wagging this head. I don't hold you responsible for our beating at Bull Run. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Lincoln. But... Lee, what those congressmen have said about you is nothing to what they've said about me. <laughs> I've been called everything from a gawky, long-armed ape to half-alligator, half-horse. Hmm. Now that I think of it, that's no great compliment. I don't think I'm a fool, and I don't think you're incompetent. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. President. Lee, I know it was you who turned a rout at Bull Run into an orderly retreat, and your men are still in position to protect Washington. And that's what I'm most interested in right now. Protecting the Capitol. I'm sure they can do that. So, you don't wish my resignation? I wasn't going to accept it. If anybody's to blame for that defeat at Bull Run, I am. You said the men weren't trained enough to fight, and you were right. But Congress and the people wanted to fight. I felt I had to give in to keep the people backing us up in this war. Besides, some of those three months' enlistments were about to run out. And we couldn't let those men go home without fighting. Mm. <laughs> well, now, what are your plans for the future? Oh, generally, sir, to destroy their military might. That's the quickest way to end this thing. Good, good. There are many of my advisors who feel that for us to win, we must take Richmond. But I believe if you destroy their army... Richmond will fall by itself. Thank you, General Lee. And believe me, I have every confidence in you. These are dark days for the North before Lee has his troops trained. But then the Army of the Potomac, with Lee in command and backed by the superior resources of the North and West in materiel and manpower, starts to win victories. The North wins the second battle of Bull Run. General Lee's Army of the Potomac, with Meade second in command, wins the Battle of Fredericksburg. Wars, of course, are not fought only by generals. And just north of Richmond, on the Chickahominy River... Hey, Yank! What do you want, Reb? How about trading some coffee for the back here? All right. We'll float it across on the raft like we did last night. You send back the tobacco. Oh, sure enough. Hey, Yank! Huh? We hear Bob Lee himself is commanding you blueberry. Is that so? Yeah. Came into camp yesterday. <laughs> you Johnnies better give up. He'll make you skedaddle. Yeah, we'll whip Bob Lee and be in Washington before the month's out. Hang on that ugly Abe Lincoln. <laughs> that boy well, seems to have a lot of confidence in himself, doesn't he? General. General Lee. Son, don't you know there are regulations against trading with the enemy? Yes, sir. Well, let's have no more of it. Yes, sir, General, if you say so. What were you trading? Coffee for their tobacco, General. Smoking or chawing? Chawing. Yeah. Have a chore. With Robert E. Lee exhibiting his usual superb generalship, the Union forces won a hard-fought battle at Cold Harbor, nearly destroying the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. A month later, in a tent near Shiloh, Tennessee. General Grant... I believe this is the second time we've met. Yes, met you once before, General Lee, while we were serving in Mexico. I've always remembered your appearance. I think I should have recognized you anywhere. 
May I congratulate you on your promotion as commanding general of the army? Thank you. I've uh, been greatly disturbed, General Grant, by the extent of our casualties here. About 10,000 killed and wounded in two days fighting. They lost about the same number, I take it. I had to risk it. General Lee, are you here to relieve me of my command? Of your command of the Army of the Tennessee, yes. You're being placed in command of the entire Army of the West. I recommended you for this new command in spite of our casualties at Shiloh. Thanks. The president agreed you were the best man for this command. I'm grateful to both of you. As a matter of fact, I was with the president when a delegation came to see him, demanding that he dismiss you from the service because of the casualties we suffered here. I like Mr. Lincoln's answer. May I ask what it was, General? Yes. He said, I can't spare this man. He fights. Emancipation Proclamation in the spring of 1862. And then with Grant and Sherman winning victories in the West, General Lee drives towards the Confederate capital. And in the summer of 1863, in spite of the magnificent efforts of such Confederate leaders as Stonewall Jackson and General Johnston, Lee captures Richmond, and the war between the states is over only two years after it started. Six months later, in the beginning of the year 1864, Edwin M. Stanton, patriotic, competent, vitriolic Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, is in President Lincoln's office in the White House. Mr. Lincoln, I was dismayed to receive your request for my resignation. Stanton, that was one of the most unpleasant decisions I've ever had to make. While the war was on, you were a good friend and a faithful servant. You were the rock upon which beat the waves of that conflict. But then why, Mr. Lincoln? Will you tell me? Because since the war ended, Stanton, in spite of my asking you not to do it, you've been carrying information concerning my plans to the very people in Congress who've been opposing them, to Stevens and Sumner, and helping them to undermine my policy. Your policy since the war ended, Mr. Lincoln, is ruining the country. The South must be severely punished. It must be taught a lesson it won't forget for a thousand years. The South has been punished. Its territory has been destroyed. It's lost many thousands of its best young men. Traitors, every one of them. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That would be my way of dealing with them. I prefer another quotation from the same book, Stanton. Judge not, lest ye be judged. You're far too weak in dealing with these rebellious states, Mr. Lincoln. It's God's will that they be crushed with an iron heel. Everybody seems to know God's will except in me, just like during the war. You'd think if God was going to make his will known to anybody, it'd be to me, seeing I'm head of the government. Amnesties, pardons, rebuilding the South. What sort of victory is this? The South has been conquered and should be treated as a conquered foreign country. But the South isn't a foreign country, Stanton. It's part of the Union. All I want is for the South to assume its rightful place in the affairs of the Union as soon as possible. Your mildness will be mistaken for weakness. Jefferson Davis should have been hung, and the rest of the Southern leaders with him. Toombs, Benjamin, and the rest. I'm trying to heal the scars of this war, not keep them open. I have no wish to make a martyr out of Jeff Davis. A martyr? Why, he's being treated as an honored guest at Fort Monroe, instead of a felon, as he deserves. He's neither being treated as an honored guest, nor is he being mistreated. You know I never wanted to take Jeff Davis. (laughs) I was hoping he'd get on his horse and ride right into the Gulf of Mexico and never be heard of again. Going to admit him to bail and send him to Canada. The North will never forgive you if you do, Mr. Lincoln. Stanton, having Jeff Davis is like having an elephant who wants to run by the hind leg. Best thing to do is let him go. Mr. Lincoln, there are men who feel so strongly against what you've been doing that, heaven forbid, they're even willing to... Well, there have been threats. I know, Stanton. I don't reckon anybody wants to kill me. Anyhow, not badly enough to succeed in doing it. I don't think these are empty threats. I appreciate your concern for my safety. Stanton, 
I don't think anybody appreciates your great services during the war more than I do. And of them, I have nothing to unsay. And yet, we have reached a point of mutual embarrassment in our official relations, which it seems cannot be overcome, or longer sustained consistently with the public service. Very well, sir. You will have my resignation in the morning. General Lee, I have on my desk Mr. Stanton's resignation as Secretary of War. I can think of no one who is more suited to that job than yourself. I'd be pleased if you would accept the appointment. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. I appreciate your confidence. I'll accept. Lee, do you know one of the reasons I've taken such a shine to you? What is it, Mr. Lincoln? Well, you've never found fault with me. Three months later, the home of Secretary of War Robert E. Lee at Arlington Heights. It is late in the afternoon. General. General Lee. What is it, Blair? I've just come from Washington. I have dreadful news. The president has been... What about the president? Mr. Lincoln's been shot. Murdered. The president murdered? You sure? He was shot while taking a ride in his carriage. I saw it happen. Abraham Lincoln killed. Who could have done such a monstrous thing? Some madman. His name was Phillips. He shot the president and shouted, so die all traitors to the Union. The Union? They say that his brother died in Andersonville prison during the war, and he hated the South so much. After Abraham Lincoln's assassination by a northern sympathizer, Vice President Hamlin succeeds to the presidency. But he is blocked by the northern radicals in Congress bitter towards the South. The presidential election of 1864 is but a few months away, and the Republican convention is in the offing. At Lee's home at Arlington Heights, 1864. Mary, I've just received a visit from Mr. Blair and a couple of other gentlemen, important men in the Republican Party. Yes, Robert? They've just come from a meeting at the Willard Hotel with quite a few Republican leaders, and now they're convinced that one of three men will be nominated for the presidency. Oliver P. Morton, Salmon P. Chase, or possibly Charles Sumner. Every one of them committed to destroying Mr. Lincoln's policy towards the South. Oh, that would be a great tragedy, a very great tragedy. It would be that. Congress has already thwarted every attempt President Hamlin has made to carry out Mr. Lincoln's plan of reconstruction. And those military governments they've re-established all over the seceded states except in Virginia. I think it's terribly wrong. The South is already embittered at its treatment since Mr. Lincoln's death. If someone like Mr. Morton or Mr. Chase becomes president, the country will be split wide open. What did they want with you, dear? They, uh... They wanted to know if I would accept the Republican nomination for president if it were offered to me. What? Mr. Blair said I was the only man who believes in Mr. Lincoln's policies towards the South who could win the Republican nomination from the radicals. And in this year, that's the same as election. What did you tell them? That I couldn't consider it, of course. For one thing, I'm not even a Republican. I've always inclined towards the Democratic Party, although I've never voted in a national election. They said that made no difference. The important thing was to carry out Mr. Lincoln's policies, and I was the only man who had a chance of doing it. That's very possible. But, Mary, I'm not a politician. I've never even considered this possibility. I have neither the desire, talent, nor capacity for such a position. You can do anything you set out to do, Robert. But my entire life has been spent as a soldier. I've always believed that no such man should be president. I still believe that. But if you were to become president... Oh, Mary, the whole idea is ridiculous. I'm sure I couldn't be nominated, not to say elected. Virginia has just been readmitted into the Union. People will not forget that Virginia seceded, and I'm a Virginian. Yes, but they also won't forget that you led the Union army to victory. You're a great national hero. 
I believe you could be president if you wish. Mary, all I wish is to stay here at Arlington with you and my family. I've had so little time to spend here. No. Besides, Mary, I'm an old man. You, Robert? Oh, you'll never be old. Well, I'm too old to undertake that job, Mary. Arlington must be rebuilt. Well, we've hardly started to rebuild what was destroyed during the war. So much work to be done here. But, Robert, if you were president, you could do so much for Virginia, for the South, for the entire country. You... You are the only one who could heal the breach. There are others, Mary. There must be others. And so I place in nomination a man who we know is reluctant to accept and yet I am certain he will yield to the demands of his fellow Americans. That great patriot, that peerless soldier, that friend of Abraham Lincoln, and the man I am sure the great Lincoln would have himself chosen to lead our country into the paths of peace, prosperity, and unity. Gentlemen... I have the honor to nominate General Robert Edward Lee. March 4th, 1865, in front of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. You have just heard the first episode in a new series, Stroke of Fate, in which we show how fateful decisions and accidents might have changed history. Now, it is our pleasure to introduce our history consultant on tonight's program, president of the Society of American Historians and twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Biography, Professor Alan Nevins. It is true that Lee hesitated whether to take command of the Union Army informally offered by Lincoln and Scott, or the forces of Virginia. Had he accepted the Union offer, had he brought his experience, sagacity, determination, and belief in attack to the side of the North, the Army of the Potomac would have had one masterful commander instead of its succession of five failures. Second Bull Run could have been a Northern victory, not a defeat. There would have been no Antietam, no Gettysburg, no Sherman's march through Georgia. Lee might well have made Cold Harbor the decisive northern victory of the war. However, Lee, for all his brief hesitation, was certain to accept the southern, not the northern, command. He was certain to do so because intense devotion to Virginia had been ingrained in the Lee family for more than two centuries because he felt that the Southerners were his people, because he denied that the government had any right to coerce a sovereign state. Lee said, General Winfield Scott, you have made the greatest mistake of your life. We can only wonder whether our national history would not have been brighter had Lee, as in tonight's story, found it possible to decide for the Union. Thank you, Professor Nevins. Be sure to listen next week to hear what might have happened if, by a stroke of fate, the plot of the Earl of Essex to depose Queen Elizabeth had succeeded. Featured on tonight's Stroke of Fate presentation were Roger DeCoven as Robert E. Lee, Cameron Prudhomme as Lincoln, Peggy Allenby as Mary Custis, and John McGovern as Edward Stanton. Others in the cast were Kermit Murdoch, 
William Keene, Ken Williams, and John Seymour. The narrator was Walter Kiernan. Stroke of Fate is produced by Mort and Lester Lewis, conceived and written by Mort Lewis and directed by Roger Bauer. This is the NBC Radio Network.